a, a very well, warm welcome to everyone joining the Lifetime Learning Part 2 webinar with Dr. Marsha Braden. I know in Australia it's customary now to begin with an acknowledgement of countries, so I'd like to acknowledge in Aotearoa New Zealand, we recognise Māori as Tangata Whenua, the first people of Aotearoa New Zealand, and the Treaty of Waitangi as our founding partnership document between Māori and Pākehā. So my name is Andrea Lee and I work as the Executive Director for Fragile X New Zealand. And I'm also the mother of an 18-year-old son with Fragile X. It's lovely to be partnering again with Fragile X Association, Association of Australia for this webinar. And again, well done to all of you for making time to be here. I know what you learn today will make a difference in your life and the opportunity to continue for all of us to deepen our understanding of our sons and daughters is invaluable. I know we will all learn new ideas and strategies today that will make a difference in, the li in our lives and in the lives of our family members affected by Fragile X. So I'll hand over to Liz to share welcome to country for Australia and for housekeeping for the webinar. Thank you, Andrea. Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Liz Jewell, and I work as the Family Support Counselor with Fragile X Association Australia. Uh, I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. A special thank you to Zynerba Pharmaceuticals for the educational grants and making this two-part series with Marsha Braden possible. So it's my very great pleasure to once again welcome Marsha Braden. We're so fortunate to be here together with Marsha and to benefit from her immense knowledge and experience working with individuals, families and communities impacted by Fragile X for more than 30 years. I'd like to just um, share a little bit about Marsha, remind us of the things that she, the you know, her career. Marsha is internationally respected and acknowledged as a leading expert in Fragile X in both learning and behaviour. She's presented at many international conferences and workshops around the world. Marsha is a licensed psychologist and brings insights also from her background as a teacher in both general and specialist education. She is the author of Handle with Care, more about Fragile X, and the contributing author to many books about Fragile X. Marsha is a member of the Scientific and Clinical Advisory Board to the Fragile X Foundation. Most importantly, Marsha brings her heart, empathy, deep thinking and intellect to help us all understand how we can best and support individuals impacted by Fragile X to learn, grow and reach their potential to be their best selves. So handing over to you, Marsha. Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Marsha Braden, and I'm here today to finish up the lecture about a lifetime of learning. So this will be part two of that lecture. And the timing couldn't be better because this is the beginning of your school year and we're kicking off your new school year with lots of learning activities and information about how to teach individuals with Fragile X Syndrome and also how to support them in the work environment. So the first part of the lecture actually um, involved a lot of discussion about the phenotype and the learning characteristics of those individuals who are affected with Fragile X syndrome. And I gave a lot of examples of how understanding that phenotype could allow for more success in a learning and a work environment. And then we also sort of discussed some individuals with Fragile X and how we can uh, traject out some of that learning to the future. So I think that's a really important part of this particular webinar, because we're not just looking at learning in a school building, but we're looking at learning at home, in the community, in a vocational setting. Uh, those are all very important aspects of this particular webinar. So let's begin. Let's start to talk about interventions and, and interventions that work and why they work. So we want, as we said earlier in part one, we want to match that phenotype with the reading programs, with the math programs, or anything that we're teaching these individuals. These are programs, reading programs, that are available in the U.S. I think some of them are also available in Australia, but I decided I would just post them so that you could kind of see that there's quite a number that really capture that learning style and, and are much more successful with kids with Fragile X because of the fact that they utilize that visual global learning style. We definitely wanna talk about briefly the logo reading system, which again 
is really more of an example for you to see what I'm talking about when we talk about matching the phenotype, the, the kind of, of learning that these individuals need and, and how we match that with a curriculum, with something that we can give to them that they're going to learn from because we know that they are behind, that it's a developmental delay. And really, frankly, they don't have any time to lose, do they? We really want to make up for some of that lost time in that reading. So let's be sure that we include some of these particular things so that they, in fact, can have success. And it, I don't know about you, but if I was involved in a reading program that I tried and tried and tried to um, learn and it was sequential and it was phonetic and I was never learning, I'd probably want to give up, wouldn't you? So we really have to, they deserve, they really deserve to have us look at how they learn and then develop programs accordingly. So you can see that logo has these logos that um, we got permission to use that are from fast food logos in the United States. And we really looked at this as an in really an incidental template here because they knew all of these. No one had ever taught them any of this. And so just expanding on that logo and then looking at how can we make a word out of the word sub as part of subway? Well, there's a tub and that could be something that's similar. And how can we make a word out of um, bell for Taco Bell? Well, well. And so again, this is how it was how it was developed sort of an additional reading program that I've developed beyond the logo reading is that once they're really attending and having a good time with identifying some of those words, then we're looking at Word Builder, which is using word families to put um, a, a beginning sound and a family together so that W and AG, AG is the family, we can have WAG, we can have BAG, we can have all kinds of words that have that word family, and we add on a new sound. So they're essentially then reading words. This is how it works too, to identify the word and the picture, because we don't want them to just put things together and then not know what that word stands for. You know, reading is really a, an important piece of understanding how a written word describes or labels a picture. And I think sometimes we forget that that's what we're really teaching these guys is that, oh, here's the word for this picture, or here's the word for your object, the hat. So again, it has to tie together to make sense to them. This is Edmark, and we did have that as one of the, the programs that we often use with kids with Fragile X, and I think you can get it um, or have it um, sent to you. But what I like about it doesn't, you don't need to buy it. That's not the point. I'm just trying to give you an idea of what does visual reading look like. So once again, we have a strip here and they've, they've used um, words in the past and they've learned these words so that then they can string them together in uh, a sentence. But it's the comprehension visually that we're looking for, because remember, they are visual learners. And so here they know that this says she sits at the table. Well, this is like a little, I don't know, piece of paper that matches up to a picture. And it's a word, it's a sentence card. And so you match it to a picture, but we have a whole bunch of other pictures. You can see here's a cowboy and there were other girls that were sitting at a table, um, but they weren't reading or there were other girls that were standing, but they weren't at a table. So in other words, there's a lot of distractors that could match up to this particular phrase, but they're not correct unless we see a she sitting at a table. So it forces them to understand something visually. This is what it looks like uh, when an individual with Fragile X is reading. And you can see this teacher is really very good at giving those cues over and over again, because these are the guys that become very impulsive and just want to put anything down and they're not really reading properly. So let's watch this. And a car. Oh, so what do we need? Horse. Thank you. Here we go. Try again. What do we need? Ball. Perfect. And car. There you go. His. So you can see through that example that he was going to put anything down that he 
had in his hand. But once the teacher said, let's try this again, you can see that he had to read the word ball and he had to read the word car and he had to find those picture cards in order to be correct. So again, it's more of an experiential sort of program, but it also looks at that visual component. Uh, now we look at something else that would be checking for comprehension. And that would mean that they would be reading a phrase and that phrase would communicate something. Again, we're teaching them that written language, printed language reading is a way of communicating, right? It's not just something that you just do and then you close the book and you're finished with that for the day. So in this case, this individual is, is actually asking for something in a written format. I want the letter puzzle. So whenever I ask him what he wants, he's going to hand me one of these phrases. Now he may really want the puzzle, but he hands me this. So he's gonna get a game because that's a way of forcing that comprehension to make sense to him. This is another one where this young guy just loved these particular um, you know, vehicles and he liked playing with them. And so they were high strength and we put them into a worksheet. So again, he needed some help with math. He also needed some help with identifying his colors and some reading. And so this makes him pay attention to detail. And I can check it very quickly if he has two buses, if red buses, if he has a green airplane, if he has three red trucks. So again, this is a critical piece of learning to read. That's that comprehension that is set up through the visual um, angle. And again, this is another one where he's going to string some beads, but the first one has to be a purple bead. And then he has to string three blue beads. And you see what this does is this enables them to not only understand that these particular strips of words stands for something, but it also gives him a sense of direction. Now, how could we then march this forward to when he actually has a job? He could read then what's in the job to put together in the line or to assemble or something like that. So that's why I want you to think of this globally. I want you to think of this long term. What we're doing Doing here can transcend into a work environment, can transcend into an adult situation where these individuals are being taught now, but can use these skills later. Now, math is a tough one because math is sequential. And these are just some of the things that I've come across that really help with math um, and, and teaching math. So again, not all of these would be available to you but I'm going to show you some examples of things that I've created and I want you to replicate them. You don't ever have to worry about getting permission from me to try something that I've shown you on these slides. Please, that is not necessary. My whole purpose is to give you ideas and hopefully even excite you about developing your own ideas to reach the kids that you uh, teach. So why is math so tough? Well, math is sequential. And remember, from the first lecture, we talked about the fact that these people do not learn sequentially. They learn simultaneously. They learn the global. So they see the whole picture, not the parts, okay? Um, it builds on a sequence and cannot be taught through a context, meaning that once you start with your numbers and the value of numbers, you have to kind of understand that before you can add those numbers, before you can subtract those numbers. That's the sequence I'm talking about. Um, also memory for unrelated facts. I mean, truly counting and then telling you how many coins I have in my hand, that really doesn't have a lot of connectedness, does it? It's pretty hard uh, for them to put that all together because most of it's unrelated and they need associations to remember. And also the one-to-one -one correspondence is compromised by their poor impulse control. They can't slow it down enough in order to count those objects and to stay slow enough so it's one and then the next and the next. And that's a big part of math. So I want you to watch this. It's If you've ever taught math to anyone or counting, you're going to know how hard this is. But let's let's watch this guy go through counting. Would you please count those dots for me? One. Two, three, four, five. Correct. Put a five down below, please. Five. Yep. And below. Uh -huh. Okay. Now I want you to look at the next set of dots right here. 
Okay, two of them. Now I want you to look at that and see what it looks like right here. One. How many was there? I. Okay, go for it. So what he was looking at was the, the five that he had just counted. That's a little bit hard to, to watch this video and understand. What I was getting at is he can count these because we've worked and worked on it. But in essence, when I covered this up to try to get him to look at this, he actually knew what five looked like. He can actually tell you, we went to this one too, and I didn't get it on the video. But this one, when I said how many, he could tell me that there were six and I had to go back and count them because he said it so quickly. So in other words, the visual, the global, the wholeness of this is six, not one, two, three, four, five, six. And I've heard this from a number of people that when they've asked individuals to count or to tell them how many dots are on a paper, they actually just look at it and they can tell you as a global sort of set rather than a sequential counting. So making it functional and math has to be functional. There's no reason for us to teach math unless it's going to be used in the community in a functional way. It's really very true. And so what can we do? Well, you know, the one-to-one -one correspondence, that's really hard, but if they're handing out papers or they're doing something that maybe is distributing a set across the table and we've set up workstations to do that, that really helps with that one-to-one -one correspondence. Um, so that you can kind of see that that's at workstations and this one needs one and this one needs one and this one needs one. The writing and the identification, we look at prices that things cost. We look at value of bills and coins and phone numbers and home addresses. That's all um, that number ID and in a functional way. So it's worth spending the time to learn it because we really want our guys to know their phone number or to, to know their address, right? But that's worth spending the time on, not necessarily how much is two plus two or what's five divided by five. Any of those sorts of things are really wasting their time. And then the number and shape identification. I like this too, like using a calculator for the numbers to actually be able to add uh, cooking. That's a great place to learn um, number identification. Playing card games, another way to do that. And, um, you know, there's numbers on cards oftentimes, and that's a nice way to match up. I've done that before where I've made, um, you know, an activity out of number cards or uh, just any kind of card games so that they're seeing threes and fours and they're they're sorting and they're putting the threes together and the two of hearts together and so the two of spades together and so it goes. The stocking of shelves and organizing things, this is another way to sort of look at how many we need in there or how many are left in the, in the box and we have to put those up there. So I think any of that is a good way to teach the, the functional math, but I would not spend a whole bunch of time on facts and on math in general, because generally that's not going to transcend into something that's functional. The equivalence board is something that I came up with because I was just wearing out trying to figure out how to teach some of these basic concepts to kids with fragile X. And it is so difficult. So I went back to the old autism literature and we did um, the stimulus equivalence paradigm where it is put with same. And those of you that are board certified behavior analysts or have worked in behavior with kids on the spectrum or even with kids with fragile X know what that means. So we put something on one side of the board and we say, match it up on the other side, make it look the same. And that's exactly how I developed this. So let's take a look at it. You can see that we can start. So here's the board and this is the equal sign that you just put on there so that they know um, what we're doing at this point. And I start with objects because I think that tangible sort of hold it in your hand. This is a two, this is a two, it feels like a two. That's important. And so I put this out and I might give them three or a distractor or maybe two yellows and a blue. And we just play with that until we get this matched up. This has to look the same. So put with same. Then we go over and we use two cubes but we might associate it with pictures. So two soccer balls is the same as two cubes. They're both the same. And then we get into the numerals. So this is two and then cubes, and this is the two that stands for that. 
Then we're matching up the two numeral to the two numeral. And so it goes, we go into money, we go into clocks, this is analog and digital together. But the main thing is to try to get them to understand that this is the amount that is represented by this numeral. When we use money, I think it really is effective and can be a way to count or to make a purchase as a reward. Uh, the token boards that we use, and you saw that when we were working with Porter, that he had his um, his tokens. And um, a lot of times we might use pennies or dimes or nickels in the token. Uh, and that we can use to count and learn to count up and use at a school store or vending machine. This is the math program that um, one of my colleagues developed. It's different than touch math, but it is imposing, uh, superimposing pennies, our, our US pennies, onto these particular numbers. And so when there's three pennies on here, one, two, and three, they know that that three stands for three. When there's four pennies on here, they know that four numeral stands for four pennies. So again, that makes it, it makes it more clear in terms of the value of the number. Here we go with the, with the token board. And again, we're working for something here. We need five pennies and that will make a nickel. When we expand this, this is all US coins, I apologize. But when we expand this, then we can put two nickels together to get a dime. And at the end of this activity, because we're working on the green board and not the blue one, which only uses pennies, we have an example of a way that we can kind of construct that two nickels equals one dime, and then they get to buy a reinforcer. So again, that's another way to make it functional, to use this as a token, and then to go forward as far as two nickels makes a dime, and learning what um, they can put together to uh, make a dime, to make a quarter, etc. Again, money. I mean, if they want to earn something that costs X amount of money, then they can learn how to match this up and what it would cost. And I'm going to show you a lot of examples of math because what I've learned through the years is I'm teaching the same concept over and over again because they have to have a lot of repetition, but I'm trying to use all kinds of different materials that I've made. And at this time, everybody was into Angry Birds, so we were doing matching up um, the, the eggs with the numbers and that kind of thing. But we were trying to teach that same concept with different materials over and over again. Because if we just stay with one material, they're going to get so bored because they need the repetition that they won't survive this. So again, there's a way to kind of look at number ID. Here's another way to look at number ID and kind of putting it into a sequence. So again, these are trains and a lot of our guys love trains, but in presenting this to them, but then having them line them up in order. So this would be the one, the two, the three, the four. And that's another way to teach that concept, but with new and different materials. This is another way. So this is packaging, very nice way to teach uh, numbers and uh, value of, of certain things. So if we need two rubber bands to go into this green school packet supply bag, we're going to find two rubber bands. We're going to check it off, which they love to do. And then we're going to put it in the bag. And then we're going to go to one pencil. And then they put the pencil in and they check it off. Again, another way to teach the value of those particular numbers. Here's another way. We can teach the sequence here of how you count but we can also teach the value right here and the number word. So again, there's a million ways that you can do this so that they don't get tired of, of the particular activity. So now let's move on to executive functioning deficits because that's something we talked about earlier uh, in the first lecture and how that often becomes a problem. It's a challenge, it's a barrier for these individuals. And if you remember, we talked about executive functioning as planning and executing. And so when you get stuck and you're not flexible, you can't develop another strategy. So if you failed once and you keep doing it over and over again, it's frustrating. But if we teach you how to be flexible, you can fail once and then change that response pattern in a, in a more flexible way so that you can get the end result. 
This teacher does a really nice job of that. And you're going to see that this guy gets stuck. And yes, he gets very angry and, and he does some self-abuse. So try not to get upset over that because she really has done a wonderful job with him. And he's learned so much from her. But we're going to start out with him putting things in order. Um, I think it's numerals. Right here. So he's having trouble starting. Remember, that's the execution. He's stalling out. She's waiting him out. What's the plan and how does he execute it? Where is number one? Where is number one? <gasps> there it is! Where is number two? Where is number two? Where is, where is, where is number two? Two! Okay, I wanna talk about this because that was masterful. He was stuck and he was trying to get started and he didn't know how. And you notice you just kept kind of twirling the numbers around and around. We see kids do that all the time. And so she needed to do something to get him to initiate. So she started tapping the table and singing. And that was a way for him to continue on this particular task and to get it going. So again, I think I can start where I stopped. Let's see. Now she's gonna put out more three? stimuli. Where's number three? Where is, thank there you. There he What's goes, next? he got it. What's number three? Now more stimuli. He's trying to find the next one. Looks like he's got Seven, it. Four. Okay, oh, so we're going to stop there because I think this really shows you and gives you a good example of how we can start that executive functioning and, and kind of get it going. So start the motor. Uh, he was stalled out. He was having a hard time. He was circling around with those numbers. And once she started tapping and singing, he was able to listen to her and execute. So let's look at that. How do, we, how do we structure it to, to build and to reconcile that executive functioning deficit? Well, that frontal lobe, and we talked about this in the first part of this lecture, it really makes it difficult for them um, in terms of executive functioning. That's what we need in order to, to make a plan and execute it. And it really interferes with that getting started that self-correction that he needed, he would get stuck on the same thing over and over again. What did she do? And again, this is masterful. She used rhythm and music, so remember that. The first step you might have to do for them, it's not doing it for them, it's getting them started. It's jumping that hurdle. Um, using the verbal or the fill-ins. Um, backward chaining, which again, we talked about earlier, that's like leaving out part of the back of the of the word, the back, back part of the word, and having them put it in for you because it's unfinished and they're going to want to get that chained properly. The intonation, you notice that she used different intonation. And sometimes we even use accents and they really like that. That appeals to them and it gets them to listen and, and to really engage. So what can we do to ensure that learning? We can use some structure. We can use some predictability by using scheduling. We can have inclusion with non-challenged peers or coworkers. We can have consistent behavioral intervention. And this is really important because if we know why there's some behavioral overload, uh, it's a result usually of something academically that we're asking or a task that we're asking them to do. And they don't have the ability to override some of their challenges. Our job, obviously, is to provide that intervention with some positive supports. Um, we have to support the families, the co-workers, the staff. We need visual supports and visual schedules and lots of communication, um, assistive technology, sometimes visual icons, low-tech technology, just to get them to understand what the next step. We use this a lot in vocational training. And it's really important to um, remember that, yeah, we used to do that in school. And I remember he really did well with that. Well, it's not going to go away. And just because he's now 20 and not six or seven doesn't mean that he doesn't need that visual support or that schedule or some way to sort of spur him on to get the job done. 
So here's some visual schedules at home and, and at school. You can see how they lay out. These guys just love to know what they're doing and when they're doing it. We had a bunch a job chart at one of the high schools that we used, and this was something that um, one kid would do this and another this, and their names were over here. And this I love because it's really a visual of the house rules. So you're gonna walk inside of the house. You're gonna wait and take your turn when mommy and daddy are talking. Those are all, and you notice we have visuals with it. Those are all things that would be rules, house rules. And it's just really important to refer back to that. So let's say they're interrupting you. All you have to do is you look at this, point to it, and, and point to the picture, and that's a good way to redirect. So it doesn't seem so punitive and they understand exactly what you're asking them. A schedule at work. This one um, is really kind of interesting because we put this up at work and we changed it every day because he had different things that he needed to load and unload, but he knew exactly the sequence and we could just write in on the whiteboard what he needed to do. So once again, even though he was 25 and working, of course, way outside of the school environment at a restaurant, he needed that visual schedule to have him understand the steps of what he was to do next. Again, the structure, this is so important so that everything is there, they know exactly what they're doing. And if we have this in a school environment, we have to replicate it in a work environment, in a community environment. Why would we take it all away when it works beautifully in a school setting? So we go to this, and this is something that's at a group home where one of my clients lives. And this is kind of what their, their jobs are. So they've got names up here that we took off just for confidentiality. But here's their jobs, the two things that they're supposed to do. And here now is also a cubicle that has all of their work in it for the day and what they're going to do with different therapists or what they're going to do at different jobs. And again, you have a place where you can put this in there. This is, okay, what's the weather like? And how do we dress today? And again, looking at what's appropriate, because if you're going to work, and you're going to be in a van and it's pretty cold and you're in the Northeast of the United States where it's very cold and you show up with your t-shirt, short, short sleeve t-shirt on, that's not gonna work. And then you're gonna miss a day of work because it's, you're going to be cold. So again, this, this is all part of what we've established is necessary to be successful. So let's look at some of those vocational challenges and what do we use to kind of help support and what works? Again, this is lifelong learning. And so we wanna promote that lifelong learning. We need to match the environment, give them social opportunities, and then also a certain skill set. Now, remember that the guy that I told you about that was just really wonderful with the computer, I mean, really skilled, the problem there was that no one, he, he couldn't match that up with his verbal skills. And so he presented as an individual that was very low functioning and the people that were hiring him couldn't imagine that he could do some really difficult sort of tasks at the computer. So they really didn't even give him a chance at that point. They um, basically didn't give him the job. And so that's why we came up with this idea of let's do a video where he's actually transferring files on the computer and we can use that as a way to help promote him and to help him get that job. So again, um, we've made so many monumental gains uh, related to what we know works in a school. Why not replicate that into a work or community environment? It just makes perfect sense as far as I'm concerned. I hope it does to you as well. Now, we don't often see the world of work as a learning environment, but it truly is. That's a way that that person can um, promote his learning in, in that community. There's so many lessons to learn in a community, and we have to use those supports that have worked well in a school. So let's match that up. We talked about social opportunities. We looked at skill sets. So the goal is to share those successes that we've had in schools so that we can foster a better work outcome for these individuals. And believe me, they're observing things all the time. They're learning from people that are in that environment, in that work environment. And they're doing things exactly like their coach has asked them to do because they're imitating. They're good imitators. We talked about that, didn't we, at the in the first part of the lecture. 
And so again, we want to share failures that point out we, you know, we want to share those failures um, that point out the lack of planning or necessary supports with the job coaches. We want to show them that we know what we're talking about. When we get these guys in a community, they need X, Y, and Z. And if we don't, there are failures. Here's an example, and I get those out all the time. This individual was put here because they thought that he was low functioning and he couldn't do any more than what he was doing. But guess what? He was bored stiff there, and that's when we started getting a lot of behavioral outbursts. So we have to be really careful about that and explain how this individual with Fragile X is a viable worker. This is such a good example of exactly what I'm talking about. So again, this individual, not real verbal, um, not able to communicate real well. And so this is a failed work situation, totally failed work situation, because nobody took into account all of those barriers, all of those issues that individuals with Fragile X might have. So what do they do? They put him in the basement, cleaning the stairs, and the sensory piece is active. He has to walk down the stairs backwards. He is then doing all kinds of gibberish and talking to himself because he's anxious. So watch this, and you can see what I'm talking about. This is a total vocational failure. I don't want to hear it. Yeah. Yeah. So you can see, we don't even have to see any more of this. It's a job that's ridiculous um, to ask him to do. He's got to balance himself. He's got a broom and he's got a receptacle to sweep things into. And he has to walk backwards and he has to be balanced. And he's trying to hold on to the rail plus work. It's impossible. They have not taken into account any interest. Who's interested in this? I mean, this is not, not very easy. And I know we all have to do jobs that we're not interested in, but this was his primary job. Um, sensory wise, a terrible disaster because he has to worry about what's behind him. He has to walk backwards. It's a mess. So we went to work on this one and we talked to a number of people and um, said, let's try some other activities, some other work environments, some other jobs. And we got him to this job, which is very quiet, which has him using a machine that he's very comfortable with. And look what happens. Desk upstairs, reception desk, one open door panel. Was done. Good job. He's a little man. And he's very careful with this. He has to put a certain strip in. And then he can get, get this done. Sorry about the camera work. I need to focus on my work. Yes, you do. So how are you, Donna? <laughs> But what a different person in this environment so that he, in fact, now is using machine. He is laminating some brochures. He's able to see what he's doing. I mean, he's very careful with how he's setting this up and it's working beautifully for him. He feels so good for it with for what he's doing and good about himself. And again, because we put him into an environment that, first of all, used some of his innate ability gave him the opportunity to work in a place that didn't have as much around him to have to deal with. And he's now at a place where he can add to those skills and be a viable worker. So what do we do to promote that lifetime of learning? We definitely need to keep that interest going. Uh, we have to allow for a lot of imitation, less coaching and coercion, right? But just that imitation, that um, bringing them into the fold, so to speak, letting them be a part of the team, um, encourage that internal motivation that we know they all have 
to complete the task. And then if there is a discrepancy between that task that has high interest and the person's ability, then all we have to do is task analyze that, those steps of the task and teach him those things he doesn't know. Not the whole thing because he can do part of it. So just look at what he's doing. He's really interested in it and where he breaks down, that's the step we're gonna teach them. So we can see this guy is loading up produce and he's working at the restaurant. He's doing a great job. And so here we are, we're getting him working. He has to pick things up. He's lifting from the bottom and he's bringing it up. And he's really, he's really a strong guy, which he likes to have reinforced. And he's putting the produce on a shelf. And here he's doing the same thing. He's so happy to be working. That's a cold place, by the way. He's breaking down the box now, and he's so happy to be a part of this. So again, just watching what he needs to do, breaking down those tasks. He's a part of the crew. He's working successfully. And here he is. He was with three different people. We were sort of job coaches, and we were looking at how much help he needed to get this done. Five is independent. So if he's just doing a, needing a little bit of help at the four level, that's where it really is, is feasible. Well, each one of us was getting at least a four and some of us even more than a four. So he wasn't needing a lot of support. And that's my point. We want them to be independent. We want them to be able to work by themselves, but we have to provide those supports, those visual supports. He had his visual schedule. He had us there just when he needed that help. And he was able to, to um, go ahead and succeed. Now, this is a wonderful lesson because he is learning by watching this guy make tortilla chips and, and you know get them ready to go into the oven. And so watch him. It's really fun to watch. I've heard that. Did he walk them or just give them the Too much. Yeah, right. Oh, Juan knows the answers here. Juan? Very nice. Uh, this is not the same, the same way. Not so long. It's really like this guy that is. Like that one? Yeah, it's really good. Variety, right? Uh huh. Yes. The mechanics look like this kind of corner. Yeah. I don't want to get it to around. Uh, you know? Who is this kill? Oh, you said, I don't know. This pepper, this oregano, this black pepper, salt. Was good. You know? Was great one. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's better one that it took, you know? Just having him watch Juan do the sprinkling and now Juan's going in and watching him. And there's so much to that social component. So now he's learning some jobs at the restaurant that he can do independently. So let's conclude with kind of what this whole two-part lecture was about. It's really about learning as a lifetime endeavor. Um, using those same strategies that we know work in school settings that transcend into, a, transcend into a work or community environment. We have to have those supports. We can't just say school's over. Yeah, that's as much as they'll ever do. Or they were really successful in school. I don't understand why they can't do it in their job or why they can't do certain community volunteer work. Well, it's because we haven't provided those same supports that we gave them in school, right? It's pretty simple, really. It doesn't just end when they graduate. And then also supporting continuous learning. So we know that beyond graduation, they're going to be more and more independent and they're going to have more and more ability to function and their world is gonna get bigger and bigger and they're gonna feel so successful in those situations. So now I'll take questions if any one of you would like to ask questions. Oh, thanks so much, Marsha. I, I just love the way you reminded us 
about how we need to incorporate the fragile X learning style to lifelong learning and, and the strategies that incorporate this style of learning and working to strengths. I know my son likes to use an Italian accent to help him get through tasks and to engage and help with executive functioning challenges. And then, you know, so important that you've, you've, you've reminded us that, um, you know, the strategies we know that work, things like visual supports, schedules, imitation are important to you. And it's important to use those strategies and supports that we've had a success with in school and transfer those into the workplace. Of course, it makes sense, but we just uh, wonderful to have that, that reminder and some really concrete, um, successful um, examples there. Thank you so much, Marsha. So many golden nuggets in terms of ideas, understanding, introducing practical strategies um, to support individuals with fragile X in daily living, um, learning, and, and most importantly, to help them gain independence. So thank you once again, Marsha. We look forward to seeing you You're at welcome. future webinars. And thank you, everyone, for attending and coming up with such amazing questions and comments. Once again, a special thank you to Zynova Pharmaceuticals for the educational grant and making this two-part series of webinars with Marsha Braden possible.